you have a pack that's, let's say, um, what would be a good example? Uh, oh, let's say, let's just use one of our packs. If you have one of our packs and you, you buy it off the classifieds, um, you didn't really know what you were getting into and you're not sure if it fits right or whatever the case may be. In most cases with our packs, we can get it to fit anyone because with the, the ability to raise and lower this and raise and lower the yoke, we can get it to fit. Now, with our pack, and I didn't go over this earlier, obviously the taller you are, the more these shoulder straps need to be extended or the longer your torso is. But at the root of it, if we slide these down, uh, you know, when we lower these load lifters as low as they can go, you know, the, the 26 inch in frame is actually simulating a 22 inch frame. It's taller, it's gonna hit you in the back of the head, but it will feel, for the most part, like a 22 inch frame. When women come in, like we had one come in the other day, the 24 inch frame fitter, she didn't like the height, so she went with a 22 inch frame just because she didn't want the overhead angle. But you are able to get it to fit. If you don't have all these different adjustments on the pack you currently have, all hope may not be lost. You can do some custom sewing potentially, um, or it might just fit you. Some guys will take uh, Everly stocks and they'll, they'll do these like kind of little goal post things and they'll extend the, uh, the, the stays and then they'll, they'll bend their own aluminum and they'll basically make a functional suspension out of an Everly stock pack. You can do stuff like that. Um, I think that pretty much covers the, the nuts and bolts. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about just those stick packs? The, um, just like a fanny pack? Yeah. They're, I mean, they're good. It really, right, you know, it's the, the tool for, you know, whatever wall you're building that day. Like, for me, I carry too much crap. I got 30 pounds of camera gear. My lunch won't fit in a fanny pack. But a lot of guys, they do, you know, they do like those hip packs. You're not going to get any kind of a functional suspension out of it. You know, it's going to be kind of just there, but they're not a, they're not a bad deal at all. Um, Okay, I, I was going to go over that in the part two, but I'll hit it today. Um, it cannot be talked about too much. <laughs> so, if the way that you want to load a pack, it, and this isn't really a, this isn't an arguable thing, this is just kind of how it is. It's some things you can kind of have different opinions on, but when you load a pack, and if you split the pack into thirds, the bottom third is where you want your light stuff. Sleeping bag, usually for me, I put my sleeping pad, sleeping bag, hanging from the weather, my puffy jacket, my ground cloth, all of that goes into the bottom. And then in here, it's my heavy crap. Depending upon what kind of water I'm running, if I'm running a huge bladder or whatever, all my food is generally going right there. Food is like the devil and the savior, and water is. You have to have both, they're both heavy as hell. So if I'm, if I'm going on, uh, in the case with Phil's hunt on the sheep, we, we had no water up high, it was horrible. So we were packing um, four to six liters to the very top every day, it got awful. And we had all of that weight up against our back for water. And then all the food was right here. And then you kind of stuff stuff medium range to lightweight crap around your food and your water meaning if you've got your stove put it in there you just kind of wedge it around to keep it in place and then in the top I generally put lighter weight stuff back in the top but fast access stuff you know you want to use common sense when you load your pack you don't want to put something vital to your day-to-day -day activity in the bottom so you, you need to decipher that but lightweight heavyweight and then also some medium weight stuff and then light to medium up top here if you keep it at the root of it, the heaviest weight up against your back, you're, you're good to go. Um, as far as packing out meat, which I'm gonna cover this in, in a different portion, you know, in the next couple weeks. If you're packing out meat, guys get really nervous. This load shelf thing has been a huge deal in the industry where you can separate the frame from the bag. You can do that with our packs. I don't suggest it if you have seven days of gear in your frame or in your bag and then you put a debone animal between the frame and the bag and you're extending all of that away from you, you're not gonna stand up right. You're gonna be hunched over. It's really uncomfortable. The system that we use, um, 
We just put the lightest scrap in the bottom, wedge as much deboned meat into a dry sack, and then wedge that into the pack. And at that point, it's kind of um, um, every man for himself, really. You're strapping crap wherever you can fit it to, to get it out from wherever you're at. You, I, we just do our best. Um, if you use the meat shelf, it doesn't. It's not a bad idea with light, uh, with smaller packs. Or if this is relatively empty, this bag, you can extend the, uh, the the bag away from the frame. Throw a quarter in there. Use all these compression straps. Strap it up. Not a big deal. It's when this bag is loaded full, and then you put stuff between the frame and the bag is when you run into uh, just some issues. And I mean. It, it works, the load shelf system does work, you just don't want to extend the weight too far away from it. Anyone else? No? Okay. So, I was gonna hit, uh, actually you guys can pick so I don't talk forever. Would you guys rather talk about footwear or uh, food in the back country? Anybody have a vote? Footwear, footwear, footwear. Footwear? Grab another bag. So with footwear, we get a ton of um, done a ton of questions on, you know, footwear. Just answering uh, with the podcast and everything. One thing I will say is uh, there is no right or wrong with footwear. There is only right or wrong for each specific person. Uh, in my case, I wear pretty stiff. I wear really stiff boots for the most part, almost a mountaineering boot. And uh, in some cases, like Brian. Uh, on the podcast, Brian Paul, he's got the foot of a Native American. He can hunt in five fingers, no problem at all. Never has an issue. Colton, you kind of run like a moderately stiff boot. Uh, Frank, he's running a super stiff boot right now. What are you running? What? Kenetrek. Grant's running a Kenetrek right now. What are you running? Yeah. The, uh, I've got special The idea or the, uh, the concept behind footwear, obviously, is get you A to B the most comfortable you possibly can without getting plantar fasciitis or any other crap like that. Which, what you're gonna have to do is one, figure out the boot that fits you, which is pretty simple. Go put it on and see if it rubs your heels and everything else. At that point, you're gonna kinda wonder, you're gonna kinda wanna figure out, okay, I've got a soft boot, I've got a stiff boot and I've kind of got a medium boot. All three of those seem to fit. Most people are going to have problems with heel rub. I do. In fact, like right now, I've got, even with boots that fit, not to show you guys my feet, I've got Luco tape on the back of my heel just to prep for doing cardio so I don't get heel rub. Um, in my case, I have a shallow heel cup or a narrow heel cup. And so the back of my foot at the top portion of it as I hike, it rubs and I get huge blisters, so I pre-tape them. Anyway, so this is a Scarpa Triolet. It's stiffer than Woodpecker lips. You can moonwalk on it. It does not flex really at all. I have semi, they're semi-crampon compatible. Uh, this is one of my favorite boots. It's relatively heavy, not horribly heavy. It is not great, even though we elk hunted in them, it's not great for elk hunting because you get a little bit of the Frankenstein action going on. They're stiff, uh, there's no flex to them. The pros to a super stiff boot like this is when you're climbing, if you had, you know, Aaron Snyder going up the race of the mountain with super flexible boots, and then me with these, I'm going to beat me with these. These are going to be faster climbing. The reason why is they don't flex so when they don't flex, I'm using less muscles in my foot that transfers up my leg, meaning less calf muscles, less quads, less hamstrings. I'm basically just doing this with my toes all the way up. And you have less fatigue. Less fatigue means less oxygen. Less oxygen, obviously, you're going to be able to breathe more. You're going to be able to go faster. I'm not a doctor. That is the most redneck way probably you've ever heard of it explained. When you get these, these are like super flexible. Um, with these, the bonus, you can break them in in like a day. You don't even have to break them in. They're quieter, for sure. You also, you know, depending, they're gonna fit more people. The more something flexes and wraps around your foot, contours to your foot, the less you're gonna have to worry about friction. With these, since they don't flex at all, 
any walking I'm doing, if there's any pressure point in my foot, it's gonna rub. Where this, it just kind of contours around my foot. I mean, with this, it, it moves in all kinds of different directions. So this is kind of like a lightweight. This here is like an ultra lightweight. It's almost half the weight of this boot. I wore this though, my great friend Clay Lancaster said, wear this on Tiburon Island, it's great. It'll stick to the rocks or something. This was, that was a horrible idea. This thing, like it, cactus was going through this. I mean, literally half the treads gone on the bottom. And uh, it, I had hot spots. Tiburon Island is not like the most extreme in the world, but everything is straight up and straight down. It's 100 degrees. So my foot was sweating. When it was sweating on the inside, my foot's just doing this the whole damn time. And I had hot spots on the bottom of my feet. So these, if you're hunting out of the truck or whatever, or you just have inherently durable feet, then you can get away with something like this. The worst mistake I ever made personally was listening to South Cox say to wear one of these boots like this on a backpack hunt. But South has feet that are like a hobbit. They, they are indestructible. He can do whatever he wants. I can't. I have, I have feet like a baby. I get hot spots really easy. Well, what happened with this is we went back, we killed two elk, we tried to do it in two trips, and I gained a full half a size in my foot from one trip for my arch dropping because there's, there was no arch support in these. So when I, when I met my wife, I had a size 11. I have a 12 and a half, well, 12 and a quarter foot now for my arch dropping for packing heavy loads without enough support in the arch. And now I'm starting to get plantar fasciitis, which is also because my calf muscles will ball up. But it's not the same for everybody. I've definitely found that. But if you don't have good support in your footwear, you're probably going to get plantar fasciitis. Your arches are definitely going to drop. Um, and I found that out the hard way. With these here, this uh, is a crispy boot. Um, Kindle Card actually sent me to try these out. I haven't really used them that much. It's a full grain upper leather, meaning it's all leather in the upper portion. This is kind of the standard, what I would say the standard boot for most hunters when they think of a boot, this is it. Kinetrek kind of makes the same type of boot. This isn't overly stiff. It's a little bit heavy. Uh, the pros, leather usually lasts longer. Uh, cons, it takes a lot longer to break in. Leather always takes longer to, to break in. Some say 50 miles, some say 500. It, it just takes a long time. I don't use uh, leather boots as up very often. I hardly ever wear all leather boots. In the case of this, there's some leather in this. There's some synthetic. This has got all kinds of crap on it. I don't even know what all that is, but there's a bunch of different synthetic stuff on here. There's no leather, there's some Cordura. This is probably gonna be more waterproof as well as this, uh, you know, when you're making your choice. These things, they leak like a sieve, um, both. These brand new leak. Uh, they're super comfortable. This is one of La Sportiva's better boots, but I didn't get up to here last weekend in water and my, my, my foot was soaked. Um, anytime you get anything really flexible, um, I'm sure I'll get yelled at by Gore-Tex for saying this. The Gore-Tex, when it flexes that much, it's going to have issues with the stitch lines or the tape lines inside the foot. I've never seen Gore-Tex make it more than a year in a set of footwear. They always leak within a year uh, for me. Some, some people, they might not have. Um, so anyway, those are a few different footwear options that I, I guess, use for this. I use this, the, the trio lace for almost everything. These I'll use for training and when we're going in and out of the truck for kind of light duty stuff. These I'll never use again. And these, I would guess for most people, this would be the standard boot most people would get. They're a little bit heavy. The leather, you know, take a little while for the break in, like I said, but they will last longer than most of the other type of boots. Uh, before I go to insoles, does anybody have any questions on the footwear? Yeah. Any recommendations for low sink waterproofing? But I've got some boots alert to the end there after a year they started leaking and that's nope. everything. No sand waterproofing? Yeah, no sand. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's on the unicorn's back. They ran out. No, they don't make that, man. I tried. There's nothing. They don't, because uh, especially whitetail hunters get that, you know, and they try to go no sand. If you spray it on and, and let it sit forever and don't wear them, it'll, it'll gradually, you know, work. The waterproofing will stay, but the smell will go away. 
But yeah, it's horrible, man. I'm sure you know, you're blowing elk out, especially your initial trip in after waterproofing them. I have Nick Wax and G Wax and a bunch of stuff. All of it smells like hell. Um, as far as insoles go, there's a few, there's a ton of different insoles on the market. Um, in the case, let me get these out of my this is a spin coat. Uh, it is not a high dollar insole. It's something I used just because it was squishy. I think like 20 bucks. It does have decent arch support. Um, I, as far as aftermarket insoles, depending upon who you ask, to me the important thing is arch support with an aftermarket insole. You need the arch support whether you have a flatter foot or a super high arch. You're buying that to support your foot. If you buy a, uh, an insole that's more or less flat with not much support in it, obviously the way that um, humans are these days, they're used to that support, you need it. With this, this is a little bit stiffer um, insole. There's a heart, I don't know if you can see that. That's actually hard plastic here, which is where the support comes from. That's just for the arch. This one is a lot squishier and a lot more pliant than this one. This is a bit stiffer. This is more like a, a super foot or super feet or whatever they're called. It's more like that. This is a custom orthotic. Um, I just got these and I wish I would have got them 10 years ago. This is a carbon shank. They body mapped my foot. I stepped in the foam. You can actually see here the, um, from packing too much weight and being a toe walker, the fatty pad on my foot right here is worn away and the tendon is rubbing on the bone. So they just uh, made that little indention and believe it or not, I haven't had a problem since I put these on. My, which I thought this was all kind of um, like, uh, not fake maybe, but a lot of this was BS, like how important it was for your feet. I thought, man, it's, it's fine, it's not that big of a deal. Now that I'm getting um, scratching 40 and my feet are all screwed up and my body's catching up with me, my plantar fasciitis from wearing these is actually starting to go away with stretching, probably because it's giving me the support I need in, in my arch. I'm not a doctor, nor a, did I probably listen that well when I was talking to the foot doctor. But when he explained the plantar fasciitis to me, um, is the, <clears throat> the tendons, I guess, on the bottom of your foot, they start to tear or rip apart. And when you wake up in the morning and the bottoms of your feet hurt really bad, it's because they were healing all night and uh, you're tearing again, I, I think is how he explained that. So in my case, I, I have a bit of overdeveloped calf muscles and I don't stretch them enough. And that calf attaches to the part of the foot that has a lot to do with plantar fasciitis. Uh, and that is why I'm, I'm getting it as much as anything as well as my calf falls up because I don't stretch it. And that pulls that tendon around my heel and that, that's what's causing it. Does anybody else in here have foot problems? You get like giant heel blisters, crap like that? Hot spots on the bottom of your foot? Yeah. So in the case of like these, um, which you can use two, two liners and you can use a liner in your sock. I hate doing that. Yeah, you can do that. A lot of it, what insole do you use? I would say that might help. Um, I've learned real quick, this here is a super soft slip it's basically like having a, when you have a liner in your, your, when you use a liner, you put the liner on, you put a wool sock over it, and you don't get as much friction on your boot because the sock, as it's rubbing, is giving that friction to the next sock, I guess you could say. In the case of this, the polymer on top here, or whatever the hell that's called, is slick, so you don't get as much of the, the rubbing, there's, there's less friction in there. Um, Matt, what, you got heel rub, right? No, I have toe rub because my feet are so what, do you, what did you do to fix that? I haven't. You haven't? Yeah. That um, makes a sexy boot. Okay, so we're not going to talk to Matt about his foot <laughs> problems. That's not fixable. Who gets heel rub? So at what, what le I've seen yours on Facebook. Did you figure it out yet? My calves. Yeah. Yeah, I've got two problems. My, my calves are tight, so uh, the heel won't flex the boot. So yeah. Rubbing. And then the other problem I have is my, my foot shifts. So I get great big calluses and most of them are big toe. And inside my big, your big toe. toe? Yeah. yeah. Who is raising their hand? So I say a lot of it in your arm, I've always seen it. Actually, I see both feet and it's actually some of the heels. But if you look at most of the things that are on the bio, the muscles are flat. And there's really no ice form in the bottom. 
And then you have hot spots potentially on top of blisters. You're talking about wearing boots at the outside, maybe full size bigger in case you get a heavy load. What about when you don't have that heavy load and you're doing some steep down and it doesn't have any screw up? No, you just tie your boot. I mean, this this portion here, once you tie it from here to here, I mean, if you have it tied, it can't slide forward. It's that weight that's pushing it forward. So if you if you lace your boot up relatively tight, what's that? Well, yeah, I mean, it, I'm trying. I'm being, I've tightened them enough where my foot went numb. Obviously, you don't want to go too too tight. But from here up is going to keep that thing from sliding forward. And I don't. Did you notice any difference when you went through? It up. It, my, she went a size bigger and if I remember she it was a little weird at first because that gap but it never I think mentally she thought it would bug her but it actually didn't bug her once she got going you know what I mean it was more that she, she shot she thought your feet swell through your icicles and then the boots your icicles you know swell so What, what type of boot are you wearing? Any other type, mostly crap that ends up growing on. So the crap part is where it's at. Um, <laughs> if you have, a, let's say, a Danner Prom horn. Um, I, I, I like Danner crap down Yeah, so with, with a Danner, it's stretchy leather. So if you don't, if, if the boot you buy does not have a good lacing system right in that ankle portion, or it stretches. If anybody's ever got, went on, owned a Danner pronghorn and used it on like a five day backpack hunt and it rained, you started out with this big gap here. By the end of the hunt, they're touching. That's because they're crappy. Um, the leather's crappy. It stretches. The more it stretches, the tighter you have to make it. Eventually, you hit a breaking point, you can't get it any tighter. Or as you're hiking throughout that day, you, you, it's stretching and so your foot's sliding for it. But if you have a good harness system, in that heel area, you shouldn't you shouldn't run into any problems. The problem, with what we're talking about, is is uh, is good boots are expensive. What are what are tennis shoes? Four fifty. Four fifty. These are three something twenty nine three eighty nine. Um, I've got some other ones that are not like it's a, a bragging thing. She's about to kill me. I got some that are four eighty. I think that are when I got to wear crampons. But it's my feet, it's kind of how I look at it, and, and I gotta walk on them the rest of my life, so I'm trying to take care of them. Put a plug in for one shot here, I bought a pair of Tennis Yeah. And uh, they were amazing. Uh, and they're about to be breaking period. Which model did you get? Do you remember? Uh, you you got, print? I think the 400s, the Mountain Extreme 400s. Yeah. The yeah. yeah, yeah. And that, that's one thing, too, that, you know, guys. It's hard to get the do all in any gear. Um, you know, like, hey, what's a boot I can wear whitetail hunting and elk hunting in? And uh, that probably doesn't exist unless it doesn't get cold where you whitetail hunt. It's pretty hard to um, to have one. You can get away with two um, a lot of times. Sometimes you can get away with one, like that 400 is a good well-rounded boot for a lot of stuff. But in, in early elk season, it, it does get a little bit warm if you bow hunt or it can. Um, I guess the only other thing than that is don't listen to me or Braden or Grant or Colton or anyone else when we give you uh, an exact boot, make sure you go try it on because because it fits me. It certainly doesn't need to fit you. I've got two questions. One, uh, what is the right size, do you think, as far as, because some boots have, you know, as far as you're talking about jumping around the upper part of your ankle, you know, you on the one boot you have maybe two um, laces. laces or whatever. Some, you know, it can be eight inches or even ten inches. You see snake boots. You know, That's obviously you wouldn't want to use those elk hunting, but what is the right size for that? My other question is, what's your take on uh, wearing silk? Because when I wear wool um, and stuff, I'm going to get sweat, and even though it's in my foot gets hot, it's not. Yeah, yeah, uh, Cool Max or silk or whatever. So the first one is, uh, for me, that happy point is eight to nine inches. I like my boot height about this height, eight to nine inches. Any more than that, I think for me is overboard. And I, and I do have people tell me I wear this uh, high boot because I need ankle support. But from, from my experience personally, once you get to eight or nine inches, you're, it's kind of like driving a semi through the drive through to order a burger. You can do it. It's probably not needed because you got enough support in a good boot 
in an eight or nine eight or nine inch tall boot. Obviously, snow and water and all that stuff aside, meaning just the fit. I think you get enough ankle support with eight to nine inches. I don't have ankle problems though. I could see, be singing a completely different tune if I had bad ankles. But for me, eight to nine inches is, is about right. I also like a fairly beefy lacing system. I like to have a locking lace here if possible. And I like to be able to cross at least twice, uh, you know, in the upper portion, sometimes three. And I think Frank's got a set, it's got three. It's nine inches tall. It's got, a, a, it's got three crisscross lacing, lacing sections. And it's also got two locking sections, one down here and one up here. So you can really lock that lace in so you don't slide forward. On some of the cheaper boots, you don't get that locking lace system so the, the, lace, the, loop, the laces can loosen up and you can slide your foot forward. Um, yeah, as far as Cool Max and Silk, I think that's personal preference. I don't know that there's a right or wrong because I just got some Cool Max and I don't even notice the difference, but my buddies swear by them, the Silk Cool Max stuff. I just, I wear, I have darn tough uh, socks. I have uh, Fits, F-I-T-S, and then I have the First Light Merino Wool, which they're all basically the same thing. I like those, they're kind of a merino blend. And then I just got some Cool Max and they, see, they seem good. I don't notice any difference doing cardio. I don't get like more blisters or anything. I just don't notice a heat difference. Have you played around with the, uh, the boots that have the, um, the boa uh, that, that you basically spin in? It's a, it's a metal wire that just yeah. sends everything up? Well, my mountain bike shoes do that. For, for hunting, I think it's, uh, is an Under Armour doing that? Is that who I tried on? At one of the shows I had some, really for um, the uh, the type of hunting I do, I would never use that because I can't pinpoint the tension. That's an all or nothing tension as you twist it, it's tight and the whole thing. Where me, my when my feet swell, I'll leave this down here really loose. I'll lock these in so I've got the gap down here and I'll tighten the living sh crap out of the upper portion here. Um, where with that, it's all, all at one time. I like to be able to... My feet swell up real bad. Brady mentioned it, like yours must too. Yeah. I get to 13, 14,000 feet, my feet swell up huge to the point I'll lose feeling in them. So I'll have to loosen these up quite a bit and then I'll lock these up here and a little bit tighter. Anything else? No? All right. I probably talked enough. I was gonna go over food, but we can, unless, you got, does anybody else have any questions? I think we probably wanna wrap it up, it's eight o'clock. Anybody else have any questions on anything? In general? No? All right. Well, I think on uh, the next part, I'm going to go over basically my gear list from top to bottom and uh, some alternates, things like that. We're going to go over food, caloric intake, um, basically kind of the wing it method, the buy it and the build it method, like how we make it at home because we dehydrate our own. We'll cover that in the next portion. And then some of the cool stuff I get to play with for gear wise. Is there anything specifically, if you guys come back, anything specifically gear-wise from Kafaro you guys might want to see or something else I might have from a different company that popped out of the top of your head? No? Okay. Cool. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody coming by. I feel you got me. I'm going to go with 